uh, for this fall. Um, and uh, the, the, the first session was actually for the, the uh, postdoc uh, recognition week in September. Um, we will have uh, the next one on November 10th at four, same, same location, so to speak. Um, I wanna thank uh, Julia Fulgham, Kate Cunningham, Sandy Rodrigue from Advance, um, uh, Mary Jo Daniel from the OVPR uh, office, and Aaron Haney from CTL, all of whom uh, have uh, helped organize this event. Um, and uh, we're gonna have four speakers today. Um, this, the format is the same as usual, which is a seven minutes presentation, and then we'll take some time for Q&A uh, following each of the presentations. Um, and uh, our first, we're going to go just kind of uh, clockwise around the, the poster. Um, uh, so we'll, our first present, presenter is uh, Diana Dragomir, uh, whose presentation is entitled Planets Around Other Stars, Looking Beyond the Search for Life. Diana, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, hang on, let me just see, share screen here. Um, all right you should have that now okay yeah so i'm gonna use this a uh, special trick and then play all right okay um can you all see um more or less the slide good yes. right. okay um all right so uh so i'm i'm dana i've uh just started you and i'm uh I don't know, a year or two ago, I can't even remember. Um, and so uh, before I launch into this, uh, let me just define uh, one thing, which is that in astronomy, um, we call planets around stars other than our sun, we call those exoplanets or extrasolar planets. Um, so back when I used to travel before the pandemic, um, uh, when people asked me what I did, I would tell them that I study exoplanets. And so they would always ask me about aliens um, and whether we will find any and whether I think they exist. Um, and the students uh, emailed me to work with me and they want to study atmospheres of exoplanets so that they can learn about whether there's life on other planets. Um, so with that in mind, um, I am here to tell you that the joy of exoplanet discovery and study is elsewhere, uh, not just in finding life. Um, so uh, let's get started uh, with a little bit of history. Um, so the first planet discovered around another star than our sun was discovered in 1995. Um, and since then, you can see in this diagram that the number of exoplanets discovered has grown a lot. Um, so in the first few years, we would discover a few uh, exoplanets a year. Um, and then later, we have been discovering even hundreds of exoplanets per year. So that's a lot of exoplanets. Um, we are actually still looking for more. Uh, and feel free to ask me about why later. Um, but for now, let me tell you that from the exoplanets we have discovered so far, we can extrapolate and we can determine that basically, um, well, approximately every one of the 200 billion stars in our galaxy has at least one planet. Some of those stars have just the one planet. Some of them have several planets, like the solar system does. Uh, so, okay, uh, there are exoplanets everywhere. Um, most stars have a planet uh, or an exoplanet. Um, so what, what are these exoplanets like? So first, let's have a little primer of the solar system. As a reminder, in the solar system, we have um, four terrestrial planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars. Uh, they're pretty small. They're mostly rocky and have a little bit of atmosphere, if that. Um, and then we have four gas giant planets that are much bigger and are mostly made of gas. And lots, you know, a whole plethora of small bodies, dwarf planets, comets, asteroids, and so on. Okay. 
Well, the first exoplanet that was discovered, uh, the one in 1995, which, by the way, um, got uh, to the authors of that discovery paper, the Nobel Prize for Physics in 2019. So that is Didier Kello and his advisor at the time, Michel Mayor, who are Swiss. Um, so yay, my field is recognized by the Nobel Committee. Wonderful. Um, all right, so, so that first exoplanet uh, is called 51 uh, Pegasus B. Uh, happy to talk about names later, but I don't have time right now. And that was a what we call a hot Jupiter exoplanet. So basically it was the size and mass of Jupiter. So it's a gas giant planet. But unlike Jupiter, it was extremely close to its star. Still is for that matter. Um, so to give you a sense here are the orbits of uh, the terrestrial planets in the solar system. And here is in white, squint please if you need to, is the orbit of uh, 51 Pegasus B if it was orbiting our own sun. So it's orbiting much closer to its star. The year, so one orbit uh, of 51 Pegasus B is three days, that's it. Um, and the star of that planet fills its sky, okay? So just put yourself, imagine being on that planet. It's just completely different than anything we have in the solar system, uh, where the closest planet to the sun is, is Mercury, and it's still pretty far out compared to this exoplanet. Okay, other surprises. Uh, well, astronomers have started searching then for planets around smaller stars than the sun. Here's one. This star, Trappist 1, is actually the size of Jupiter itself. Okay, it's a very small star. And indeed, we have been finding lots and lots of exoplanets um, around these small stars as well. Uh, except everything about those exoplanetary systems is scaled down for those smaller stars. So below here, uh, the bottom layer is the sun and the terrestrial planets again. And then if you zoom in, much closer in here, uh, I don't know if you see my mouse, around the sun, um, zoom that out, uh, you have a scaled down uh, kind of solar system, but around uh, what we call a red dwarf star, which um, is much smaller and less luminous than the sun. And then finally, uh, well, there are many more, but one more really cool discovery that we found that is not like the solar system at all is that some planets orbit two stars that orbit each other. So many of the stars that we know of um, are in binary systems. So basically the two stars orbit each other. Um, and there are planets that orbit around the system of two stars, like Kepler-16b here, um, which is actually a little bit further out than the orbit of Mercury would be in that system. Um, and then just in my last minute, hopefully, uh, the, the final and perhaps to me most interesting discovery so far um, is that if you, so if you look at the solar system, we have these terrestrial planets, like I said, and then the gas giants. But if you think about sizes between terrestrial planets and say Uranus and Neptune, so there are no planets in the solar system that have sizes um, not orbits, but sizes between, say, that of Earth and that of Neptune. Planets like that turn out to be extremely common. In fact, they are the most common planets in the galaxy, and we call those super Earth or mini Neptunes. Um, so those are planets that are, have a size between Earth and Neptune, and they do not exist in the solar system. We have the most common planet around every other star, basically, than the sun does not exist in the solar system. So what, what is my take home message here? Um, the take home message, uh, and I will leave you with this nice video of uh, scaled, uh, to, to scale uh, exoplanet systems, just so you can get a sense of the diversity of exoplanets that we have been finding. But basically I, I would say the universe is reminding us that when we look for other planets around other stars, we should not extrapolate from the little drop of knowledge that we know about earth. Um, but rather be open to previously unimagined scenarios and exoplanet systems. So I'll leave you with this and uh, happy to take questions or discussion. Hopefully you're not hearing uh, sound here. Hang on. Okay.
I, I like the music accompaniment. That's nice. <laughs> yeah, but then dancing. I can myself over. Yeah. Um, so yeah, if you could um let's let's go back to uh oh no, you want me to move away from this? No, I think that's okay, that's okay. I'll go back. I'll go back. I just so we can see hands. Um Oh, you want me to stop sharing? I see. I think so. Uh, yeah. So that we can, I think see, I can hands. see hands. Here. And Mary awesome. Jo Daniel was first yes. up with a hand. Mary Jo. So Diana, of course I have to ask, have you found any aliens? No. <laughs> Thank you for the question. <laughs> the real question is, is there was there some technological advance that caught resulted in this huge um, discovery of so many exoplanets after the first one? Right. That's a good question. Yes. Um, so space telescopes, telescopes in space. Um, here I can do this. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, uh, that were designed specifically to find hundreds and thousands of exoplanets. Um, and they did just that one in particular, the one that's called Kepler and from where the um, systems shown here. Are, are from. Yes, David? I love this. Could you just tell, say a little bit about what you specifically are working on now or, or either discoveries that you've made or what you hope to contribute to the literature? Yeah, sure. I know that that's what this was supposed to be about, but I wanted to make it, um, to zoom out a little bit. Um, no, I loved it. I loved it. It's hard to I zoom loved in. It. And... No, I loved it. And I was thinking, okay, so what's Diana? So, okay, so let me uh, play this video a little bit. Uh, let's let it zoom out a little bit. Um, and then I'll show you. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the colors here, um, the it, they kind of correspond to temperatures. Uh, so um, let's see. Um, the bluest things there are, are kind of Earth temperature. And you can think of that if the star is similar to the sun, you can think of that as basically the distance from that star or the period or the orbit of that planet. Um, so in other words, most of the planets we have discovered around other stars are much hotter or equivalently a lot closer to their star than the solar system planets. It turns out, um, we knew this from early on, that is actually a selection effect. So I'm not gonna get into why, but our methods of discovering exoplanets are more likely to find the ones that are closer to their star. And it's much more difficult to find any exoplanets further from their star. So what I work on is trying to find more of those blue dots, uh, not Earth's necessarily, uh, that's actually really hard, <laughs> mm -hmm. but we're starting with trying to find cooler, more distant from the star, Gas giants, that's a good place to start. Turns out we don't know of that many because of this um, bias. And then in time, I'm hoping to also find more distant from the star. So longer period, smaller planets, um, but baby steps. Great, great, thank you. I don't see any more hands, but I see chat questions. Let's see, um, how many exoplanets have been found so far. Confirmed exoplanets, just around 5,000. Um, but that's because we only looked at a certain number of stars. And so we can extrapolate from that number and be able to say that basically every star in the galaxy has a planet, at least one. Other questions? Then, then are, there, are there sort of breakthroughs that are expected in the future with different instruments being launched into orbit? Yeah, there are. Um, so one telescope is expected this December, maybe. <laughs> it's been postponed many, many times for a number of years now. Um, and then to keep it simple, because I didn't explain how we find exoplanets, um, we are hoping that telescopes that will enable us to use a different method a method that would actually allow us to take a picture, a very pixely picture, but a picture nonetheless of an exoplanet very far from its star. Um, so for, for that to work, you need a very, very large telescope in space. It kind of works like your camera. The bigger the zoom lens, the bigger the camera, the better you can see and the further you can see. Same thing, we need something like uh, a 10 or 
about 10 meter uh, diameter telescope in space to be able to do that. But we're hoping to do that in the next, uh, fingers crossed, couple of decades, maybe more like a few decades. Great, thanks. Um, so I think our time for you is up. There was one more question uh, from Billy Brown. Maybe you could just uh, text, uh, to put that in the chat in response to we'll the it, dynamics yeah. of, of, of star formation. Um, so our next presenter is Paulo Dutra from the uh, Department of Spanish and Portuguese. Uh, his talk is entitled Reclaiming Blackness in Afro-Brazilian Production, Machado de Assis y Hasonais MSS. And I'm sure I made a hash of that. Paulo. Thank you. Uh, how can I say something interesting now <laughs> about this after this presentation? Uh, I hope you guys can hear me. I'm sharing a, a PowerPoint. Um, I would try to respect the seven minutes limit. So first, I would like to thank the Advanced at UNM, uh, the Center for Teaching Excellence, the Office of Academic Affairs, and the Office of the Vice President for Research. Um, as the title of my presentation states, um, I work with uh, reclaiming blackness uh, in Afro-Brazilian production. And I work with uh, the most famous Brazilian author uh, from 19th century, Machado de Assis, and with the most famous hip hop music group in Brazil, Racionais MECs. Well, you may think that's odd, right? Um, but, um, I assure you that they do have something in common. And it is the fact that uh, despite of them being Afro-Brazilian, they have been approached by mainstream scholarship uh, through Eurocentric um, lenses. <clears throat> what you are seeing is a 2011 uh, TV commercial, uh, I mean, a part of it, just a little bit, uh, for the Brazilian bank Caixa Econômica Federal. So they hired a white actor to represent the, the, the author, Michel de Assis, who was a patron of the bank. He had uh, saving accounts back in time. Um, and then there was um, heated objections. Uh, the bank uh, withdrew the, the commercial and then um, ordered another one, the, the TV ad, with a black actor playing the, the role of Michel de Assis. But that, as you can maybe see in the, in the, in the pictures, aside from the for a new introduction, acknowledging the mistake they made and the change in the racial makeup of the actor, uh, nothing else changed. Actually, one of my students noticed that the, the shirt also changed, it's white now or something in, in, in the second picture. Um, both, were, both, both versions of the, of the ad plainly asserted that Machado de Assis achieved despite his, of his skin color, experienced, and more, more importantly, accepted the social status category that suggests respectability, appropriateness, and civilized control, what we all, what we call today whiteness as a category. Um, um, as Eduardo de Assis, a Brazilian scholar, reminds us, and I quote, his literary profile was made so Western that would end up leaving its mark not only upon the public image constructed throughout time, but even upon physical appearance. And that's what you have seen is a recently found uh, picture of Marshall de Assis, an actual picture with no, uh, what do you call it, Photoshop, and no, no, no Photoshop, I think that's the word. So as, as Eduardo de Assis said, the same process has been applied to his work. People thought Marshall de Assis was white, a white man. People really thought that. Uh, so his characters are traditionally read as white people. And my work has been directed towards showing that his characters are at least ambiguous. I don't have time to uh, talk about everything. So I'm going to just uh, give you one example, which is Candido Neves. Candido Neves is a character in a short story who cannot hold a, a job and resort to slave catching. Uh, back in the time of slavery in Brazil, to support his family. The author, Machado de Assis, uh, nevertheless, provides no physical uh, description of him. The reality is that there is no way for us to tell the character race. Yet, most people <clears throat> read him as a cruel white man, even though historical records show black people 
working as slave catchers too. So just like I said, many people thought Machado was a white man, and some people still think he's a white man. Uh, man many people will assign a race to some, uh, of the, to some of his characters based on the stereotypes. Um, I'm jumping to, uh, to Hassanai's MCs. Um, and there is at least one distinction between scholarship and rap music in Brazil and the United States. Regardless of the intended outcomes in the United States, racial issues in opposition to class struggle is the chief element addressed by critics. In Brazil, critics develop an opposite approach, which favored discussion on class struggle over the race in rap. As Jennifer Roth Gordon notes, and I quote, while the press and public have lauded rappers' attention to socioeconomic inequality and conditions of daily life in Brazil's social and geographic periphery, there has been overwhelming disdain for their direct discussion of Brazilian races. <clears throat> so what I do is I reclaim blackness, blackness um, by bringing to light poetic devices intrinsic to rap that discusses the lives of Afro-Brazilians, which are overlooked by Brazilian mainstream scholarship. I, of course, can only give you guys one example, and I'll talk about sampling. I hope you can listen to this. Brazil é um país de clima tropical, onde as raças se misturam naturalmente. E não há preconceito racial. <laughs> so the last message delivered like in a scholarly tone, but it is um, interrupted by the worldwide famous laughter from Michael Jackson uh, song, Michael, Michael Jackson song Thriller, right? And this is a fine example of sampling, which according to Mike Eric Dyson is a transgressive activity because rappers imply it to interrupt the narrative flow and musical stability of other musical texts. But it is also an organized construction that poetically deals with form and content. This is why this is what the sampling here delivers. Another level of artistic effect, because in this case, sampling is transplanted from the realm of music into the realm of ideological arena. What is really being interrupted is not a music, but the narrative flow and stability of the myth of racial democracy. The laughter mocks the arrogant and fallacious content and form of scholarly discourse and language, where this part also lasts around two seconds more, I clocked it, than the other. <clears throat> it is not interrupted until it is completely over. And therefore, it claims uh, artistic, uh, artistic importance. <clears throat> and here we arrive at the larger issue, the myth of racial democracy that still informs everyday life in Brazil. That's why scholarship in general erases blackness in the work of Afro Brazilians. Consciously or unconsciously, they rely on the myth of racial democracy, which claims that there is racial harmony in the country. Thank you. Thanks very much, Paulo. I, I talk too much. You were exactly to your time, so that's perfect. Um, questions? So I'll I'll kick off. Um, Paula, could you say a little bit more about um, sort of how um, considering Machado Gsis as a black man, how how does that lens sort of change interpretations of of his writings? Can you say a little bit more about kind of what what new insights do we get by reclaiming that? Well, I think the most important one, there are many, but the most important one is, is that we, we understand that Black people occupied um, space in society back in time that most people today think they didn't. Um, like upper, upper class, Machado himself was an Afro-Brazilian man who came from nothing to become the, the first president of the Brazilian Academy of Letters. He, he, he established himself as a person in the upper level class. Um, and uh, by reading his characters, ambiguous characters, 
as people who are actually circulating in high society and other places of society, we can actually um, compare to the historical record of Afro-Brazilians, Black people, uh, being regarded as um, um, things and not as people. Um, because in Brazil, they burned, actually, they burned the records of slavery in order to erase the past. But um, if we read Machado de Assis in this fashion, we can realize that that, that is always a um, there's always a project to erase the history of black people in Brazil as a successful one in spite of all um, the terrible things that we all know slavery brought to, to this continent. Thank you. There was a question um, from Jessica Carey Webb in the in the chat. Uh, do you do any comparative analysis of blackface in the U.S. and Brazil? No, <laughs> um, no, I, I, I do not. But I, I think um, I do not because I, I think it is not something that um, happened in the same way in Brazil. Um, um, because I would say blackface in blackface in Brazil, it's it's more like. Um, an actual cosmetic uh, device that people employed to look white and people still do it because of the standard of beauty, of beauty in Brazil and of course of um, status. So most people, most women in Brazil will um, you know, straighten the hair, dye the hair, um, try to look blonde and, uh, and also men will um, use some kind of language that is not associated to blackness or to black people in order to um, fit into the society. Um, so I, I, I think they are totally different, but I don't, I don't regard the fact that, that there may be a possibility to understand better both cultures if we proceed to such an analysis, but it, it just hadn't occurred to me so far. I'm a poet to me. Thank you. Um, Mary Jo Daniel, go ahead with your question. So in that that last um, quote you had there, it it stated that because, or it suggested that because Brazil was a tropical country that took care of any racism, I'm just curious, is that sort of a, a, a general thing that somehow being tropical erases differences and blends things better? Um, <laughs> well, this comes, this idea comes from a generalized reading of Gilberto Freire, which one, one of the most famous Brazilian scholars. Uh, he wrote several, um, well, maybe two or three books and several, uh, ideas about how uh, the race is integrated in Brazil. And they, although he never called it that, they came up with this idea that he was advocating for a, a racial democracy. Um, and uh, it is one of the reasons why some scholars back in time, uh, in the 30s, 1930s, 40s, or they would say, uh, that the climate was just so uh, propitious to, <laughs> to race integration. Um, and that became a, a, you know, a socially constructed truth. Thank you. Thank you. Any other but, questions? But um, just sorry. Go ahead. Just, just to say, uh, you know, scholars, they have already um, um, showed that there is no racial democracy, right? But it's still the myth of racial democracy, it still rules, still um, um, informs people, every people's life in Brazil. Although people will deny it, but we, we, we can see it that uh, the first thing someone is gonna say, this is not, this is not a racial problem. This is another kind of problem. Um,
And Paulo, has that ideology, even if it's not, you know, it's not supported by, by sort of sociological evidence, but has the persistence of that ideology sort of affected um, uh, the ability of institutions to pursue uh, affirmative action and other kinds of anti anti discrimination uh, policies? I would say yes, because that's the first um, um, the first um, fact, quote unquote, that they bring up when they they try to discuss affirmative actions and any other kind of uh, of uh, integration of of uh, minorities in this case, Afro, in this case, Afro Brazilians, it is the first thing that anyone will say that we are not the United States. We do not have the, the segregation here. We are all equal. We are all, all Brazilians. Uh, this is this is actually racist to do this, and so on and so forth. But just look at the numbers um, statistically. Um, I, I cannot give you the numbers right now, but of course, most people, most rich people are white, and most poor people are blacks in Brazil. So there is no <laughs> racial democracy. Okay, well, thanks very much for your presentation and your and your uh, uh, comments uh, in response to the questions. Very, very, very enlightening. Thank you. Um, yeah. Next presenter is. Um, sorry, I got to get this uncovered here. Uh, Hannah Matson um, from the Department of Anthropology, and she's presenting an archaeological perspective on personal adornment and social identity. Hannah. Great, thank you. Let's see. Let me get my screen shared here. Great. All right, can you all see that? Great, okay. So good afternoon, everybody. Um, I am a Southwestern archeologist and an assistant professor in the anthropology department. Um, my research focuses on the ancestral Pueblo region, um, pottery production and exchange, and pre-Hispanic jewelry and adornment. And it's this last sort of research focus that um, I wanted to talk a little bit about today. Um, and I sort of centered this around um, a volume that just came out of mine that deals with this intersection of personal adornment and identity from um, an archaeological perspective. Um, so initially, I um, explored this topic through my previous research in a big study of um, the very large ornament collections from the sites of Pueblo Benito and Aztec Ruin, both here um, in New Mexico. Um, and in that analysis, I delved really deeply into this issue in like a single time period in a single location. But in the years that followed, I found myself really wanting to kind of connect my research, you know, sort of outward more broadly um, to see, you know, how it compares to, you know, scholars that are studying archaeological, I'm sorry, my dog has chosen not to bark, um, that of other scholars studying archaeological or, um, ornaments and social identity in other parts of the world. So I was interested if there are like common themes, despite a lot of like temporal and geographic variation, um, you know, how are other people approaching this topic? So I put together this um, volume on this subject and it includes case studies from 10 different countries and spanning 9,000 years of human history. Um, and this was quite a challenge during the pandemic with um, trying to coordinate, you know, with, with, with a whole group of international scholars, but um, it was incredibly rewarding. So first of all, to sort of define what our sort of what we call as archaeologists personal ornaments. So this includes um, all these different kinds of objects that are made to be worn on the human body, you know, sort of typical jewelry items that we think of like beads, pendants, necklaces, um, bracelets, rings. Um, they can also include like ear, nip, uh, ear, lip, nose ornaments, hair ornaments even. Um, fasteners on clothing, like um, brooches, belts, buckles, um, various kinds of buttons and pins and things like that. Um, and interestingly, in archaeological context, we find that these kinds of objects often have evidence of having sort of a high degree of social value. 
Um, they often have evidence of, of being sort of curated or heirloomed, passed down through the generations, or being included in special kinds of um, deposits as offerings. So, for example, in mortuary um, or ceremonial contexts. Um, in academic archaeological research, um, these types of objects have traditionally been, and actually to a large degree still are, sort of considered uh, or treated as like decorative luxury items um, that are associated primarily with differences in wealth and status or studied um, for what they can tell us about trade and exchange and sort of you know, the movement of goods across space. Um, but we know from cross-cultural anthropological research that you know, adornment is so intricately enmeshed in all different facets of human identity. Um, for example, age, gender, marital status, um, tribal and ethnic affiliation, um, the holding of different offices or roles, uh, subscription you know, to certain ideologies, um, religious or political. And this happens at like many different scales. So really, you know, we could ask, is, is there even a boundary that we could even draw between social identity and dress? Um, and don't these objects that we adorn ourselves with really kind of craft us as much as we craft them? So my current research really aims at shifting this narrative and archaeology surrounding this particular um, artifact class and um, treating adornment not as sort of supplementary or um, just decorative, but really as this kind of vital and co-constitutive component of human identity um, in practice. So the papers in this volume all explore this topic um, and not only by examining the, the artifacts themselves, they also draw on all different kinds of other types of evidence like historical texts, um, Ethnograph, ethnographic literature, um, artistic depictions of individuals wearing ornaments, say on statuary, um, ceramics, um, things like this. So my own research included in the book examines this long standing practice in the Northern Southwest of placing particular kinds of ornaments in ritual deposits, often along with turquoise, um, shell, um, and blue and red pigments. And this is a pattern that continues for at least 1300 um, years in this area. And so I delve into sort of what this might suggest about the agency and animacy ascribed to these objects, and also what this might mean about the presence of kind of a persistent, broadly shared um, ontology in the region in the past. Um, but to kind of give you just a few examples of the really cool studies um, that are included in the book. Um, for example, there is a, um, here on the left, um, we have a study of um, Mesolithic and early Neolithic shell ornaments um, from a site in Greece. And uh, what the differences or some actually similarities between the ornaments from those two periods might say about the identity of local foraging populations as they're encountering these really early farmers coming into the region. Um, here on the right, there um, this is from a neat, neat chapter on early um, pastoralist Kenya, where there are these beautiful stone um, and ostrich shell egg beads. Um, uh, that have been found in burials associated with these pillar monuments on the landscape and what um, those might say about sort of the, the social memory entailed in certain locations on the landscape, which may have sort of anchored these individuals within this like really highly mobile sort of lifestyle. Um, just another couple cool more examples. Um, there was a neat study by a Norwegian archeologist on these um, beautiful um, brooches. And she looked at evidence for the sort of heirlooming reworking of these fragments um, over time and how they might relate to sort of this female identity that's rooted in like Norse um, uh, mythology and cosmology. Um, so just one more comment to sort of wrap up real quick. Um, so I, I'm hoping to really sort of challenge this kind of traditional and widespread view 
that these artifacts are kind of just like decorative or supplementary somehow. Um, and also really underlying that, um, you know, individual and sort of collective identities aren't just kind of reflected in objects like these, but they're also really actively shaped by them. I'm just gonna click through a couple more cool pictures real quick. These are Iron Age belt frag, metal belt fragments um, from Iran, um, Neo-Assyrian in age. It's a cool study of silver torques um, from uh, cool sites in Portugal from the Castro culture. And then there was also a neat study uh, from Pacific Nicaragua that was looking at um, shifts in, in female identity over time and um, with the introduction of weaving and how that might relate to changes in, in adornment. Great, thanks very much. So um, Helen Fisher has her hand up for a question. Helen, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. That was really interesting. And I just kept thinking about, um, I, ha I have a very good friend who has an enormous earring collection. And basically every day is a different pair of earrings and it means something different and all that. And I'm just, I'm trying to formulate a really interesting question about uh, when we look at our society today, if we were hundreds of years in the future and people were looking at adornment for um, the way that we are adorning ourselves now in Western culture in the United States, um, not just earrings, but the advent of, of quite a bit of tattooing and that's become much more of a, a self-expression and so forth. You know, what what would you say that future peoples might think about what uh, uh, the current age adornment might mean about who we are? I think the archeologists of the future are gonna have a heck of a time <laughs> sorting out <laughs> all of our various identities, which, you know, but it illustrates to like, that identity is this really flexible thing that mm -hmm. is very changeable, um, even kind of day to day, depending on how we wish to present ourselves. Um, and that, you know, it isn't only one thing, right? During, you know, think about how, how different you might dress, you know, from one decade to the next, you mm -hmm. know, and sort of how you might identify yourself differently from, I don't know, high school to college, say. Um, so that, yeah, I thought of that same issue. Uh, it's, it's so interesting to think about how someone might tease those sort of subtleties out given this, like the complexity and the volume. Yeah. David. Hi, Hannah, this is fascinating. Um, when, when finding older, uh, pieces of data or older adornments, are people looking at, or is there a way to look at whether certain adornments are associated necessarily? I mean, you were mentioning, for example, the Norwegian example, which was uh, aspects of feminine identity. I was wondering more broadly, is it always clear that certain adornments were worn by women rather than men or vice versa? Are there some that are either you don't, we don't know, or might've been worn regardless of gender? And I was also wondering if some people look at issues of so are there certain adornments that are worn to indicate power or status with the head of an organization or a family or a government where certain things that would not be allowed by common people, for example? Yeah, so in terms of um, sort of these more sort of personal aspects of identity, um, we really depend a lot either on um, burial contexts where we've been able to sex the individuals and, and then also a combination of where there's sort of artwork that, you know, we can kind of look at like how these items might be worn. Can we tell sort of, you know, the, 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 the sort of possible gender identity of the individual that's depicted? Um, although we also have to be careful in that case because often those depictions are kind of an idealized version, you know, kind of a, a sanctioned version of, of what, you know, you know, somebody should be, you know, in that society versus maybe yeah. the actual reality. Um, yeah. But yeah, so looking at those aspects of identity, often we do rely heavily on, on mortuary context. Um, and then um, 
I'm sorry. What was the, the second question? I got yeah, really, really sorry about adornment as status or power. Market. Status. Yes. So, I mean, even though archaeologists have have really, I feel like in, in, in the past, historically, really focused on the status portion of it. Um, for, for sure, it, it has been a major status symbol, you know, in, in many groups through time um, um, around the world. Um, just to give an example from my own research, for example, at Pablo Benito in, in Chaco Canyon, Chaco and culture, there are only specific kinds of ornaments associated with elite individuals in burial contexts and nowhere else, basically. Mm -hmm. So there does seem to be a strong case for certain kinds of ornaments you know, really being sort of these indicators of um, differential social status. Very cool. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And uh, final question from Billy Brown. Yeah, um, <clears throat> of course, you probably didn't have time to get into much detail. Um, and, but, but you talked about the idea of what certain adornments might say about the individual. Um, a specific example might be, are there, for example, uh, adornments related to fertility? And uh, what might these adornments mean? I don't know if there are or not. Yeah. Um, you know, just, you mean like fertility more general, like that might be their, their meaning in sort of a... Or, or might induce fertility. Oh, okay. Yeah, it, it can be it, tricky to get it at that kind of detail. Um, but I mean, we can look at ornaments are often included, as I mentioned, in these sort of ceremonial contexts and sort of like rites of passage and things like this, where people are sort of moving from from sort of one stage of life to another. Um, also, you know, in terms of like marital status, it's, it's fairly common across cultures so that's indicated in some way. You know, when it, when it, especially if a, a woman is is married and of childbearing age, you know, it's like marked in some way in terms of adornment or tattooing or something like that. Um, uh, in a more ceremonial sort of setting, I think it would be um, it can be tricky, you know, to sort of get at that that level of meaning just looking at archaeological material. Great, thanks very much, Hannah. Enjoyed the presentation. Um, uh, Loa Traxler is next with uh, new approaches to the past, reconstructing the lives of classic Maya royalty at Copan. Loa Traxler. Yeah, thanks everybody. Um, let me share my screen here and hopefully everything works well. My computer, I had decided to reboot it and then it went into a software update. So. <laughs> It's that kind of day. Um, so I wanted to say a little bit about the work we've done at the classic Maya site of Copan in Western Honduras. And I also wanna give a shout out, of course, today started with Indigenous Peoples Day and where we work uh, here on campus is of course the homeland of our uh, community friends here. But in Copan, we also work at a location that is ancestral homeland for the Chorti Maya. And so my work is made possible by their heritage and their willingness to work with us. I work in Western Honduras where we have the privilege of studying a, a site and a community that's been well studied for over a century and a half of research at Copan. And it's famous for having been known as a site of well-preserved hieroglyphic inscriptions, as well as a political history of a kingdom in the classic era that was the home for dynastic figures that we know well from both archeology span as well as textual um, inscriptions. And I have had the opportunity to work with figures that um, are known from both a long hieroglyphic inscription on a staircase for a temple mound, as well as a monument shown here that was commissioned by the last king of the dynastic um, house of this site. And what I've gotten into um, in the last year or so is working on uh, adding to what we glean from the archeological record and the decipherment of inscriptions 
to build more of a holistic view of histories of their lives in the direction of what we now call osteobiography. And the individuals that I've had opportunity to work with um, come from buried contexts underneath the last phases of the Acropolis, the dynastic founder who's mentioned on architecture that proclaim his name, including this building shown here, which was emblazoned with his personal royal name after he had passed from the scene. His name was Kenich Yashkukmo, and he reigned from 426 until his death around 437 CE in the Common Era. And we know quite a bit about him because of excavations we've been able to do and uncover, in fact, what is most likely his physical remains that were buried within a tomb context in a chamber at the very base of the Acropolis that became his commanding seat. Um, his physical remains tell a certain side of his personal history that complements what we learn from the inscribed monuments after he had passed and was remembered by many generations later of the community. His physical remains have allowed us to do not only detailed study of those skeletal remains, but also reconstructions of how he may have once looked in life this being an artist reconstruction based on his um, uh, landmarks and various aspects of his cranium, as well as what we understand from his life, from the traumas that his um, body sustained during his life, including injuries that were likely suffered during both warfare as well as ball game play during his life. We've also been able to do isotopic research that tells us where he grew up and how he likely, as the inscriptions say, came to Copan as an outsider. We also have worked very intensively on others of his royal court, including a woman who is not mentioned anywhere in the inscriptions, who is almost certainly his royal wife and the mother of the second ruler in the dynastic house. So in the sense of osteobiography, we're able to put together not only the archeological data and its many details, but then also what we're getting from the inscriptions and how we're able to, based on um, uh, very likely details that we can fill in, more of a holistic narrative about their lives. And one of the details that we are particularly fascinated with currently is the relationship between the classic Maya and their Western Mesoamerican counterparts um, in Highland, Central Mexico, whose lives were based at the metropolis of Teotihuacan and how the involvement amongst those two regions came to a head and really shaped the classic era as we understand it. I've also been involved in working in a slightly later burial setting with a later king in the same dynastic line who came into power um, in 532 CE based on the inscriptions. And what we know is that even in his life, long after the time of Teotihuacan in Highland Central Mexico was really engaged with the Maya area, that this king also had reason to reference influence from Teotihuacan in his life, very much after the primary heyday of that capital city of Mexico. His remains and the offerings left with his burial tell us that he was intimately tied with his entire kingdom and benefited from grave offerings to ensure his afterlife that were produced in a community very close to where um, his homeland was. And the pottery that we have uncovered and I've spent hours working with um, revealed that not only did it have a final decoration in Teotihuacan style merging with classic Maya style, but that it was the final decorative program after um, uh, covering over an initial decorative program. We were able to bring that pottery to the United States and to carry out 
commuted tomography um, uh, imaging of that pottery and able to get beyond the surface decorative program to the original carved decorative scheme of those vessels that were so much charged with the iconography of both Maya tradition as well as um, Highland Western Mesoamerican traditions. So we're trying to figure out what explains this continuing influence that Teotihuacan had for the classic Maya. And we see a merging of the iconography and the interest that they had in speaking to the, the cultural traditions of their classic world, as well as their engagement with Highland Central Mexico and how it gave shape to this identity of power and influence. And my most recent work is also trying to untangle and add the details of his life. We've been able to now merge not only the, the, the narrative story from the inscriptions, the details from the archeological materials and their analysis, but also um, incorporating the events from climatic and volcanic studies across Central America and piecing together his final chapters of his reign when likely um, immigrant populations were pushed out of the lands that are now El Salvador and into his kingdom and his domain. This work takes advantage of efforts by all of my colleagues um, over many, many, many years of working in Copan. And our work is ongoing. We've um, landed uh, just this year, um, I was awarded an NEH publication grant that will continue over three years that'll allow us to publish these works. And also we're going to be publishing these osteobiographies, these narrative stories of um, these dynastic figures in an upcoming um, edited volume. So that's kind of what I've been up to and I'd be happy to take questions. Great, I hope I got in under that. seven minutes. <laughs> Just a touch over, you're good. Um, so uh, let's see what questions we have. It's awfully hard to talk about a long period of work in seven minutes. <laughs> so forgive lots of slides. Mary Jo, go ahead. So I, okay, so I want a new career. All you anthropologists and archaeologists, um, you do amazingly fascinating work here. Plus, I'd also, you know, go study some planets too with Diana. Yep. Um, but, well, two questions. One is, I'm wondering if the kind of CT scans that we do at OMI, if you, if those are used and if they provide additional data on the body remains. And we, then mm -hmm. but the second question, then I can stop talking is, so I see a Disney movie coming out of this. <laughs> Have well, you heard the rights? <laughs> well, the challenge of, um, we've gotten to the point now where we think we have a pretty good handle on the architectural history of this this capital and its central architectural complex. But the CT scan work was a particular opportunity to combine with a, a exhibition project I'd been involved with, but we knew we had final decoration that it was obscuring initial decorative program of carved and excised um, program on, the, on some of these pottery vessels. So when we brought the material up for an exhibition in Philadelphia, I was able to, in the early dawn hours, take the material across the street to the university hospital and their radiography lab and do CT scanning there. Um, that is one of the best ways we found to get at not only differences of materials, of course, because they resonate differently, but also um, uh, peel away layers of added uh, um, cultural expression. The same kinds of approaches are of course being used for um, other analyses of both natural, faunal or other once living organisms, including people, as well as these kind of material analyses to get at construction and fabrication and as well as the decorative programs for these objects. So it's, it's super amazing work. And we're, 
uh, one of my colleagues in the college had gone after NSF funding to get a smaller scale portable CT scanning unit. Um, if we were able to land one of those to bring it to use it in these kinds of applications here on campus or out in the field, it would be fabulous to be able to really query and get really accurate, precise imaging to do all kinds of analyses that that are that can be based on that kind of digital imagery. It's super fun stuff. It looks super fun. <laughs> I also, I just need to make a pitch. You mentioned NEH. If you haven't seen it, we did send out a notice. NEH is doing a webinar yep. for any of you who are in the humanities and an email came out earlier this week. Yeah, I was super glad my colleagues, I have uh, my, my close friend, Ellen Bell, who's at California State Stanislaw and uh, my Honduran colleague, Ricardo Agurcia, uh, the three of us were awarded an NEH manuscript grant that just starts now in October and is gonna carry us. We hope to get the first of these massive final reports put together for publication through the um, Penn Museum at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. So, ojala. Oh, congratulations on that. Um, Hannah has a question. <clears throat> you're muted. Oh, you're mute. <laughs> Oh, sorry. I was saying it's so interesting how the different layers of, of designs and their different associations. Mm -hmm. um, so I just had a question about the, um, the, I noticed all the red, is it red ochre that's covering the burial objects? Could you just talk a little bit about what that mm -hmm. is about? So we get a really intense use of red to both indicate um, sacredness and also the sensibilities of rebirth that are often associated with burial individuals. Red color, tightly associated with blood and all those uh, familiar things uh, globally, comes from both red ochre, which is iron um, based, but also um, cinnabar, which is mercuric sulfide. And um, we get intense use of both of those. They particularly liked cinnabar um, because of how it could also deepen paints for pottery as well as be used as paints for um, body adornment and indicating that sort of rebirth aspect of re-entering or treating human remains in burial settings. We have good evidence that for these, both the royal woman and the founder, that they their tombs were re-entered multiple times and their physical remains were, were immersed in baths of cinnabar pigment to indicate rebirth. The, the founder's cranium had even the slurry of the paint on the interior of his cranial vault that preserved the deteriorated tissues within. So it's a really, a really highly charged sense of wanting to, to um, revisit and reanimate and re and bring back to the world of the living these sort of really dominant ancestral figures. They're being remembered in those ceramic figures. They're being called forth in the sculpted panels on that altar stone. It's a real interest in that they have in connecting back with the deceased um, ancestral figures. And we get it out of hematite too. They get real sparkly hematite. David, last question. Sure. Lower, this is fabulous. Now I know what you do. I love it. <laughs> And actually my question is this, um, is any of your work or the work of you and your colleagues on display or could be on display at certain museums here on the UNM campus? I, right before I came to UNM in 2013, I had literally just wrapped up a big exhibition project in Philadelphia that was an opportunity to um, speak to the craziness of Maya 2012 and all of that false calendrical hoo-ha that was going on but it allowed us to also highlight some of the findings from the wor work that we had been done. The opportunity here on campus um, is really to coordinate and to bring forward collections in the Maxwell Museum of Anthropology, as well as 
materials that tie in with both the, the art museum and uh, also the, the technical and analytical work that goes on in so many of our other um, museum institutions. But the, the, the real excitement is that we have a chance to also, we hope in time, uplift the visibility of heritage sites in Central America um, that are desperately suffering for, for support and tourism and all those facets of their economy that have been absolutely crippled by the pandemic. Um, but we have a chance to really keep working to, to make a more fully comprehensive story about these pre-Columbian chapters of history in the Americas. So there's a lot to do. Great, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Great. Thanks, Lola. Thanks, thanks to all of our presenters. Uh, I think we lost Diane already, um, but once once more inside of an hour, we've gotten uh, a sort of snapshot of the incredible uh, quality and diversity of, of, of research that goes on here at UNM. And, and I really appreciate everybody for being here and to our presenters for, for um, compressing all that they have to say or some part of what they have to say in seven minutes. So thanks very much. And we'll see you again on November 10th. Yep. Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Have a great fall break. Thank you. Bye.